Yeah, I was in prison for, for 32 years. You know? And uh, that's a primary question. Most people think that when you go to prison, especially people serving long-term sentences, the whole concern is getting out, the immediate concern. That's not true. The immediate concern is how am I going to survive what I call the rigors of prevailing prison conditions, because prison conditions are very harsh. The shattering effect that it has on you, your relationships with people, you know, all the dreams that you had, whatever you were struggling toward, whatever condition in life you was in, there's always a struggle of trying to, you know. All of those things are over, they're shattered. And you have to adjust yourself now to your life is going to be according to somebody's plan. You're told what to do, when to do it, all the time. Larry White is 80 years old, but for 32 of those years, time essentially stopped for him. They were years he spent locked away in maximum security prisons in New York State, where he was sentenced for his part in an armed bank robbery that left two people dead. No one, least of all Larry, would say that his crime didn't merit punishment. But the sentence he received, 25 years to life, landed him in a world most of us have never visited, but which exerts a powerful negative impact on our democracy. More than two million of our fellow citizens are serving time in prisons or jails today. That's the largest penal population on the planet. And if you add their children and other family members and the formerly incarcerated who are struggling against the barriers that prevent them from resuming normal life, you have the outlines of a small nation without borders existing in our midst, most of whose residents are poor, many of whom are bitter, and nearly all of whom are without a voice. So how do we get here? And are these chillingly high rates of incarceration really making us safer? Those questions were addressed in a long-awaited study released in April by the National Academy of Sciences. And the answers were startling to anyone who hasn't paid attention to the skyrocketing growth of our prison system in the last four decades. They added fuel to what some would say is a long overdue debate on whether this country should rethink its approach to crime and punishment. As we launch our new season of Criminal Justice Matters in our 30th anniversary year, we're pleased to have with us today the chairman of the committee which produced the report, Jeremy Travis, who's also the president of John Jay College and a noted criminal justice scholar in his own right. President Travis, welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Your report was a stunning indictment of a system that's been happening really in our country for the last four decades. But with all the figures and the statistics, how do you make it personal to Americans? Why should we, most Americans, care about? After all, these are prisoners. These are criminals who've committed crimes. Right. Well, I think as an American, we should just be cognizant of our own history. And uh, you know, the first conclusion of this uh, report of the National Academy uh, was that this growth in incarceration is unprecedented in our history. We've never never been here before. We've never had this uh, many people in prison, this percentage of our population incarcerated. So uh, the first perspective for an American citizen is just to ask, you know, what's going on in our country? Uh, for 50 years from 1920 to 1972, we had a stable incarceration rate. Then things started to go uh, through the roof. Uh, but there's another way that this becomes personal. Uh, the number of people in prison and the number of people cycling in and out of prison means that many more of us have uh, relatives or uh, friends or neighbors who have uh, uh, been in prison. So it's really affecting our, our communities and our democracy in a very profound way. Uh, and I guess the last point is it's really expensive. So we're spending $80 billion a year on jails and prisons. Uh, and those are all taxpayer dollars that uh, are going to support this system. So it is, it is a profoundly important uh, phenomenon that we need to understand much better. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the, um, the consequences. Your report, uh, as I said, was a stunning indictment of the system. You talk a lot about the causes of the high rates of incarceration. But what hasn't been mentioned and talked about in a lot of the, the commentary about the report is the actual consequences. Mm -hmm. What has this meant for us? And I guess we have to begin with who's in prison today. I mean, I was struck by um, one amazing fact in the report was that the the number of <clears throat> the number of um, uh, men without schooling or with basic schooling is historically unprecedented. The people who are in our prisons mm -hmm. today. Yeah. 
So these are our fellow citizens. Um, they have, most of them, uh, done something to violate <coughs> our criminal laws. So in that sense, uh, the, uh, the punishment is um, appropriate. But the question is, do people have to go to prison uh, in response to crime? And do we as a society have to use prison so much as a response to crime? And uh, one way of looking at it, when we think about the consequences of this choice that we've made uh, as a nation to, to use prison so often as a response to that wrongdoing, is uh, to recognize that uh, two million people in prisons or jails, uh, that's now one in 100 adult Americans is in prison uh, or jail as we speak, uh, that it cuts deep into certain communities, communities of color, poor communities, People who have not gone to school, not completed high school, are being uh, sent to prison at, uh, at record rates. Uh, it's mostly men. It's mostly men of color. Uh, and uh, we also need to remember that most of them get out. So that there, there's the cycling of people in and out of prison. So the prison uh, reality uh, has become an important social reality for our country. Well, one thing was certain that we, we had clearly understood that there was a direct connection between communities of color in the prison system. I mean, you know, in New York State, we're a minority in New York State, but we're a majority in the prison system. Can we draw a line or relationship between the number of people who are in prison and the type of people who are in prison with the disadvantaged communities in the United States, the high unemployment that they face, mm -hmm. plus the huge public safety problems that they also encounter? Well, the, the first thing to remember, one of the findings of our report when our committee reviewed the evidence is that the prison growth has not occurred because of crime rates. It's mm -hmm. occurred because we've made policy choices to sentence people to longer sentences and to put more people in prison uh, under mandatory minimums for offenses that otherwise might have been treated in the community. So it's not crime that's driving our prison population. It's policy choices. So, But the people in prison, as your question uh, makes clear, are coming from poor communities, disadvantaged communities, minority communities. So those communities are, are bearing the brunt of the, uh, of the fourfold increase in incarceration rates. So what that means is that the, uh, the life chances of going to prison for people who are in those communities, particularly men, particularly men who have dropped out of uh, high school, uh, have changed dramatically over the period of a generation. So just to use one statistic that I think you were referring to, for those uh, young African-American men who uh, dropped out of high school and were born in the baby boom generation, they faced, as a statistical matter, a 14% mm -hmm. lifetime chance of going to prison before their mid-30s. That's astonishing. Go, it's even more astonishing when you take the next generation uh, born in the, in, the, uh, in the 70s who grew up in the prison boom, they now have a 68% chance of serving at least a year in prison before they turn 35. Mm -hmm. So in the prison buildup, the life chances of uh, individuals uh, in poor communities, particularly communities, uh, high crime rates uh, and men, and uh, those who drop out of high school are on the margins of our society, their lifetime uh, chance of going to prison have increased exponentially. What's also implicit in a lot of what your report says is the people who they leave behind, mm -hmm. their children, the yeah. families, and the impact on them has been just as severe. Yeah. So we don't pay no. enough attention to this consequence, no. which is that most uh, people in prison have a family member, a child, one or two or three or more. They may or may not have lived with them when they were sent off to prison, uh, but they are the children of those incarcerated parents. Uh, and those children are the evidence would suggest struggling in many ways in terms of their uh, childhood development, in terms of their attachment to uh, peer groups and to adults, in terms of their performance in school. Uh, their uh, family structure is destabilized by that absent parent. They, they move more frequently. So uh, these young people, we now have two million minor children uh, mm -hmm. with a parent in prison. Uh, these young people are struggling uh, because their parent is off in prison. And we need to pay attention to their uh, those consequences, those are psychological consequences that won't play out for generations. In fact, the hardest thing for me is when I was released, you know, when I went to the pro board, you know. I had to, you, you get used to, I had gotten accustomed to it. I liked living in solitude. And going home was a problem. I have a closer ties to the people I left inside the prison system than with my son, to be trite and truthful with you. 
You know, we're just now really beginning to bond. And he understood. I told him, I said, man, you, you know more about fatherhood than I, I do. Our committee found that there's enough evidence now to be very concerned about those those second-level consequences on the children of incarcerated parents. One phrase that really struck me in your report was that prisons should be instruments of justice. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Yeah, we use instruments of justice. We also use pillars of justice. It's, it's a concept that we uh, uh, have tried to, to, to revive. It's not new to us. It's, it's a concept that uh, is uh, well-rooted in our, in our um, writings as a, as a, uh, as a uh, Western tradition. The pillars should aspire, sorry, the prison should aspire to uh, promote justice. So uh, this is a Quaker idea, it goes back to the Enlightenment, that uh, a time in prison should be a time uh, of, for reflection, for working on one's deficits, for repaying society by uh, undergoing this deprivation of liberty, uh, and that prison should be open to public scrutiny and should be seen as a part of a system that produces justice. So uh, our committee uh, found that over the four decades of the prison buildup, that this notion of the prison as a part of our justice system uh, has lost its power. So now we think of prisons as being isolated, as being removed from mm -hmm. public scrutiny, as being removed from judicial scrutiny, from journalistic scrutiny, from research uh, review. Uh, and prisons have become more punitive inside the prison. Uh, even though there are lower rates of violence, we found, uh, we double cell, triple cell uh, our prisons now. We've squeezed many more people mm -hmm. into uh, the same, uh, not the same number of prisons, but uh, uh, so, so the, we've reduced programming. So the experience of being in prison has become a very different experience from this notion that prisons should all be constructed and maintained in recognition of the fact that they all come back and that they're going to return and they shouldn't uh, return diminished they should return ready to resume their place in, in our society and be law-abiding, tax-paying citizens. The things you see in prison, I've seen them beat guys to death. You know, you be in your cell and you hear them. You hear the, the troopers come. <laughs> These are the guys with the black gloves and, and they're back, hanging out their back pocket, the beat-up crew. So they're how down there, hit cell 23. And now going in and you're beating and the guy's screaming and then it gets quiet. And you hear him whispering and the door closed and they leave. You holler downstairs, hey, so-and-so, yeah, put your mirror over there and see what's happening with him. I say, you dead, man. I was smacked around a, a while. I spent a lot of, I spent time in solitary confinement and that in itself is scary, scary. And time goes by, you know. And the thing that scared me and frightened me the most like I said, something so happened the day before yesterday. Didn't it, didn't, it, didn't, it, didn't it happen yesterday? And there's nobody there to confirm it. There's nobody there to confirm any of that. And he began to wonder, did it really happen at all? You know? I said, man, I'm about to lose my mind. We give out much too long a sentence. It doesn't take that long. It take 25 years to change a person's behavior. 25 years. It take 25 years to change my behavior. Don't take that. I mean, common sense. Yeah. Uh, so people grow old, and they know they're going to get old. And the frightening thing is not, not that I, when I go home, but will I survive this at all? So what have 40 years of skyrocketing imprisonment rates done to ourselves as a democracy? What does it mean to us? That's a great question, and uh, I think it's the most profound question that uh, we have to face going forward, um, because our report concludes that uh, the policy changes that have led to that result have come about through a political process and come about through a, because of a, a time in our nation's history that was very turbulent, uh, a lot of concern about civil disorder and the like, and uh, so politicians started running uh, for office on platforms that promise to be tough on crime. So here we are, we've been very tough on crime, we put a lot of people in prison, uh, and we have to really hold a mirror up to the country and to our uh, notion of our democracy and our particular pursuit of racial justice and ask, what have we done? What, what, what are the deeper uh, consequences? So one way to think about this is uh, to ask the question, uh, why is America so punitive over this last 40-year uh, period? And uh, how do we think differently about responding to the wrongdoing, the criminal offending that will always uh, happen? And here we are as a nation, we have the lowest crime rate in a generation. Mm -hmm. 
So this is actually a very good time for us to think uh, more um, uh, comprehensively about how to respond to crime. Most nations haven't done what we've done. So can we be more creative? Can we have more crime prevention programs? Can we treat mental illness in a different way? Can we treat drug addiction in a different way? Certainly one of the big consequences uh, that we've documented is the large number of people in prison for drug offenses. You know, that's, that's increased tenfold over these 40 years. So that requires some deep uh, conversations within the law enforcement community, the treatment community, about how to respond to wrongdoing without the heavy hammer of prison. Many people who are under 40 would be surprised to know that there was any different way of treating punishment. Right. I mean, they've grown up with this punishment yeah. paradigm, yeah. and that's all they know. I mean, is there, are there better ways? Well, is there, th there are different ways. There are different ways in our own history. Uh, we go back to the beginning of the last century. We thought about these issues very differently. We had very different sentencing policies, and a lot of those have been thrown out or, or modified uh, in ways that leave so the original concepts unrecognizable. So we have to go back to some, some core values. Uh, our chapter 12 uh, sort of sets forth some of the uh, principles that we think should govern that conversation going forward, principles that are well known in our country. One of them is the notion of proportionality, that we mm -hmm. shouldn't punish people uh, out of proportion to their wrongdoing. And we've, we've, we've lost sight of that one we uh, have. in a... many ways. The second is the principle of parsimony, that this, it's a very important notion. It's a limitation on the power of the state where this principle holds that it's, it's wrong. It's actually immoral for the state, for the society to inflict pain, to punish people beyond what is necessary to achieve a legitimate government purpose. Let's so, uh, just deconstruct parsimony a second. We think of stinginess. Parsimony. Should we be stingier with sentences? Right. The option should be... To, Give less sentences and fewer sentences. Yeah. We, we have we have people in prison now for life without parole, mm -hmm. in for offenses that where uh, that would not be have been thinkable years ago. Juvenile sentenced to prison for, right. for life without parole. The Supreme Court has said there's something unconstitutional about that, so we now have to rethink that. We have uh, geriatric prisons, yes. and we'll have more of them going forward. So so these are very deep uh, questions. These are very uh, profound questions about our democracy, and they come down to our punitiveness. Our, our, as a society, why do we think that it's important to spend so much money, but more importantly, to, to deprive a fellow citizen of his or her liberty for so long uh, for uh, offenses where previously we didn't do that? What, what, what's the benefit we're gain, gaining from that? Our committee found there's very little public safety benefit. Having an 80-year-old person doesn't get you much public safety benefit, keeping that person in prison. Uh, but it's, it's why, why is it so important to us as a society to have legislated those outcomes? Two other principles that you mentioned, citizenship, social justice. What right. is, what, how do they figure So out? citizenship is this uh, uh, principle, again, well-established uh, as a scholarly tradition, as a legal uh, uh, principle, that uh, sending somebody to prison doesn't diminish them of their, their right to be treated with dignity. That's, that's basically what is at the core of our Eighth Amendment uh, cruel and unusual punishment uh, principle, uh, and that when they leave from prison, their their status should not be so diminished that they can't regain full citizenship. So it it, it places around the prison um, experience and the prison institution this value that while you're in prison, you know, consistent with running a good prison, you shouldn't be so diminished in status that you lose your 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 right to human dignity and that your time in prison shouldn't leave you so disabled that you can't regain full citizenship when you return. That the punishment is, is what happens in prison, it's not a lifetime sentence. So that, that principle is very important. The social justice principle is also uh, a bedrock principle of our society, which is that every government institution should be seen as a, uh, as, in terms of its contributions to the well-being of our society. Prisons should be included in that calculation. So prisons should contribute to the well-being of our society, not, not take away from it. That may be the hardest call of all, because people do not see prisons today as institutions that are part of our right. national life right. or shouldn't be. Right. So should there be performance standards in prisons? Should there be certainly more transparency? We, we, uh, we uh, recommend in our, in our final uh, chapter that there be more transparency. Now, that has many meanings. 
Researchers should be allowed into prisons. Journalists should be allowed into prisons. It used to be much easier as a journalist yes. to get into prison than it is now. Uh, and there should be governmental oversight. Uh, legislative bodies should hold hearings about what's happening in prisons. Uh, we're seeing this now being played out in uh, New York City with the focused attention on Rikers Island as, yeah. a, as an institution where lots of things have happened that should not have happened. So this notion of transparency, of accountability, and that could also translate into performance standards. Let's talk a little bit about the political climate that's greeting your report. There's a lot of, the, re, the climate seems to be receptive at this point. Mm -hmm. We know that 35 states, in a recent report by Vera, have reduced mm -hmm. prison sentences, have um, reduced prison populations. Um, we're coming into a new election period, an election cycle. Uh, there are some people that are worried that the idea of justice reform or prison reform may have to be fought all over again. What do mm -hmm. you think the chances are, with your report now in place, that, that we... Well, We're on the way to actually reversing course, which is what you call for. You know, our, our bottom line recommendation uh, after we review the evidence is that the nation should significantly, and that's the word that we use, significantly reduce the rate of incarceration. So our hope is that this report of the National Academy of Sciences, which is the nation's uh, voice on science, will add to a policy discussion uh, that uh, is well underway, as you as you indicated. So what's happening is so interesting. It's, it's, who would have thought uh, 10 years ago that I'd be able to say this, but we have this uh, broad uh, con consensus in the country that we have too many people in prison. It's a left-right consensus, uh, and that we need to uh, change our sentencing policies at the federal level and the state level. Uh, a number of states are doing this. The federal government is, uh, as we speak, uh, our Congress is debating uh, legislation brought forward by conservative Republicans and liberal Democrats uh, in, uh, in partnership to reduce uh, 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 sentences. The U.S. Sentencing Commission has just voted that, that certain reductions should be retroactive. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there, there's definitely a change in, um, in the climate. I think I would caution those who are optimistic when they read those uh, particular um, political uh, um, uh, signals uh, to remember that, that we've, we've quadrupled, more than quadrupled the rate of incarceration uh, in a generation. And to uh, reverse course is going to take a long time. It's going to take a lot of hard political work. A mirror is being held to us by the Europeans, by the Norwegians and the Netherlands. You know, they take a look. You know, <laughs> now you're way behind. You know, you know you're way, we are way behind. We, pun but we don't seem to realize how deeply ingrained punishment runs through this, not just the criminal justice system. You see it with our children, even with our infants. When we admon admonish our infants, we just don't tell them, don't do this. That smack must occur. Don't, don't. It must be there. If it doesn't occur, then the admonishment is not going to have its proper effect. So punishment is really believed. But I had gotten to understand it that the uh, Academy of Sciences had, had made a statement. And my interpretation was that punishment was the least effective way, but it wasn't stated that way. We think that punishment actually solves problems. It has more to do with solving problems than to do with behavior. It may have an effect on the behavior, but it's the least effective way to solve a problem. So it's no coincidence, actually, that the report, which is done by a committee chaired by you, has close links with John Jay College, because John Jay College is the leader uh, of criminal justice education in the country possibly the world, mm -hmm. and it's a particularly important year for John Jay College, it's it our 50th anniversary, so I wondered, what else especially are we going to do for that? Have you got some special plans? I understand there's a special guest. Well, I have a special guest, and I'll bring out in a second uh, to celebrate this moment. Uh, so our 50th anniversary is a moment for us to uh, celebrate. We started uh, 50 years ago in a... Uh, couple classrooms in the police academy. All of our students were uh, in-service police officers and firefighters and uh, public servants who came to get a liberal arts education. We're still very true to that tradition. Uh, but today we stand as a uh, just a strong uh, institution that has been through some difficult times and has emerged uh, uh, in a very uh, uh, vibrant sort of way to be really the leader, uh, I think, uh, in, uh, in the country and thinking about criminal justice issues. So we have a number of uh, events coming up uh, this year. Uh, we have a display that's being installed as we speak, uh, looking at a timeline of the college. We're 
Uh, so honored that Justice Sonia Sotomayor is coming to our convocation in September to kick off our celebrations. We have a statue of uh, John Jay, uh, the man, who uh, will be installed in December to celebrate uh, his birthday. We have student events, we have faculty events, we have symposia. We have a number of things happening at the college to examine some of these is issues about the, the workings of the criminal justice system, the role of the prosecutor, uh, thinking about sentencing reform and the like. Uh, and we have, an, we have an, a, a guest who is going to be uh, present for many of those events. And so this program a mystery will, be, guest. will be one of the first places to show you a man we're calling Little Jay. I am honored. So Stephen Handelman, please meet Little Jay. This is John Jay, uh, the bobblehead figure. And he's going to visit many of our uh, special events over the year. And we hope to see him often. And uh, we're delighted that he is able to be a special guest on this show as we celebrate our 50th anniversary as, uh, as an institution named after the first Chief Justice of the United States, John Jay. We welcome you both to John Jay, and here's to a good anniversary year. Great. Thanks so much, Jason Travis. Thank you.